All right, welcome everybody. We are about to begin the very uh, last panel of the day, and we are going to finish up with the uh, topic of truth or consequences, which has to do with questioning the nature of truth. And our first speaker, speaker today is Michael DeShane from Polytechnic. Uh, hello, my name is Michael DeShane, and I'm a junior at Polytechnic School. Uh, today, I will be presenting on what I believe to be the shortcomings of objectivity. Before I start my presentation, I'd like to thank my teachers, especially Ms. Hamilton, Ms. Kenny, and Ms. Davis, for helping me refine this piece, as well as all of my peers, who make up the intellectual environment in which I came to my understanding of this topic. I would also like to thank uh, the Archer School for um, you know, make, allowing us to present here um, uh, today. To begin, I think two definitions, or at least explanations, are in order. Very quickly, in attempting to define the words objective and subjective, we get to the crux of my topic, what truly constitutes reality. Though many are quick to refer to the dictionary as an authoritative resource in factual disputes, the connotation of any given word is usually as important, if not more important, than the prescribed definition. Objectivity implies a level of neutrality that is seldom possible in interactions with others or in engaging with society. Since freedom from bias is functionally impossible, I believe that, instead of striving for crystalline objectivity, a diverse breadth of subjective views should be acknowledged and consciously synth synthesized to achieve something proximal, even superior, to what, what might be thought of as objective truth. Because individuals have distinct experiences and circumstances, objectivity is a fatally lofty goal for which to aim, both philosophically and situationally. There is an idea in Jainism, an ancient non-theistic Indian religion called Anakantavada that illustrates the shortcomings of objectivity. The doctrine is often explained with a proverb about blind men enc encountering an, an elephant. One man grabs hold of the ear and claims the elephant is a fan. Another feels its side and declares it to be a wall. The third uh, believes its tail to be a rope and so on. Taken individually, each of these perspectives are legitimate, but they do not begin to grasp the reality of the elephant. Taken as a whole, however, the men's experiences allow for an understanding of the animal. Just as our perception of our societal elephants, if you will, may not be shared, the objectivity of our individual experiences is corrupted by the way in which we interact with and experience the world. Whether it's because of race, gender, religion, or class, each person's ride on this roller coaster, or as some may see it, lazy river, we call life will be unique. Even those tasked with expertise in a given field often struggle with objective review of their respective products. Most famously, wine reviews seem to have only a marginal basis in objectivity. Of course, wine tasting is a necessarily subjective pursuit, but even sommeliers cannot maintain a consistent subjective framework. Similarly, subjects in numerous studies have favored samples that are supposedly pricier, even if their cheaper counterparts are, in fact, the exact same brand and product. This sort of perceptive trickery has been demonstrated with a number of other goods, like water and medicine, and by adjusting a wide range of variables, such as scarcity and presentation. Although, th although through different means, these studies illustrate one unfortunate reality about people. Our minds cannot objectively assess the world around us. Rather than irresponsibly placing weight on objectivity, we must actively seek out and understand diverse thought and opinions to more closely render the truth. The existence of individuals' perspectives is seldom questioned, so personal truth can serve as a, par as a far better lens through which we can analyze the world, especially in comparison to errant, errant attempts at objectivity. As, as Ralph Waldo Emerson states in his speech, The American Scholar, the world came into the, the scholar of the first age life. It went out from him truth. Emerson captures the necessarily individual and sacred process of personal reflection, spurred by simply immersing, immersing oneself in life, which produces subjective thought. No matter the extent to which the scholar processes the world around, his or her mind will have rendered its perspective distinct from those of others as a function of not only natural input and biological variants, but also cultural present and past. Environment naturally alters thought, taking with it any hope of even mere individual objectivity. This individual variability should be accounted for and leveraged to form a rational and cohesive perspective, for who is to say whether one person's interpretation of the world or a blind man's idea of an elephant is more valuable than that of another. <coughs> Although a collective consideration of the personal views Emerson describes is valuable, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, a Nigerian author, rightfully warns against the acceptance of any individual's truth as objective or even complete in her TED talk, The Danger of a Single Story. She explains that, quote, it is impossible to talk about the single story, the general description of entire people, 
without talking about power. The hierarchy of relative societal privilege, determined over years of cultural interplay, defines this sort of brash storytelling. Power dictates how stories are told, who tells them, when they are told, and how many are told. These types of generalizations, which pervade every aspect of mainstream culture and media, can be temptingly easy to accept. But allegedly objective narratives about any group are fallacious and should be treated as such. Also, I believe that a worldview grounded in, in subjectivity is neither one that necessarily embraces ha hateful ideologies as merely part of the whole, nor one that disregards expertise. A useful rule of thumb for me in considering others' views is to ascertain whether said views question uh, or negate the very existence or value of other people. As Karl Popper, an Austrian philosopher, put it, in order to maintain a tolerant society, the society must be intolerant of intolerance. Essentially, to consider subjective view, to consider subjective views is not to subscribe to some post-truth, amoral conception of the universe. In that, same vein, in that same vein, we should consider background in examining beliefs. A comprehensive review of a multitude of individual subjective perspectives, Emerson's truths, ensures a conclusion, a conclusion that, while not objective, is holistic, trending toward a collective and probably more accurate result. This practice is crucial to our democracy, manifesting in various forms, juries, voting, and reporting, for example. In a time where candid analysis is described as untruthful and political division gradually destabilizes the foundations of democracy, fantastic pursuits of objectivity should be abandoned in favor of sympathetic understanding of as many perspectives as possible. Moreover, the value of subjectivity transcends politics. The, uh, the aforementioned principle of Jainism, Anakantavada, is a perfect example. Jainism accepts the limitations of ordinary or, or individual knowledge, instead giving weight to truth in relation to, a pr to perspective. A stronger belief in this sort of empathetic thought, a subscription to the validity of everyone's views, could very well bring about the change most needed today. With this shift, we might, fi we might finally reestablish the link that connects us all as humans, our humanity itself. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. And next up, we have Archer's own Zoe Applebaum Schwartz. <laughs> <laughs> this is fine. <laughs> Hi, everyone. <laughs> I am Zoe. Let's talk about truth. <laughs> so as I see it, the notion of truth has always been subject to dangerous oversimplification. Um, its very definition implies objectivity or a reality that's totally independent from personal prejudices and sensibilities. But it's just those biases, those facets of subjectivity, that make us human. That is to say, as human beings, our perception is chronically influenced by bias and subjectivity, which is what makes the notion of fixed and universal truth unreachable by the human mind, if not totally non-existent. Now, as you are probably aware, uh, modern justice systems are particularly reliant on the sort of utopian pursuit of objectivity. Um, and this distinct critique has been explored across countless mediums by countless philosophers and speculative writers. However, I chose to focus on Japanese author Akutagawa's short story, In a Grove, and Akira Kurosawa's canonical movie, Rashomon. Get ready. <laughs> First, I want to briefly focus on In a Grove. Basically, in this sort of absurdly puzzling modernist ghost story, the author details seven different witness testimonies in the investigation of a man's murder and the rape of his wife. Um, while the audience is supposed to reconcile each testimony, we basically learn that every account is refuted by another. Really, no matter your angle of inspection, no truth goes undisputed. Uh, the tale's narrative inconsistencies will range from the incremental to the fundamental. You know, on one hand, a set of testimonies will vary in whether or not the suspect was riding a horse. On the other, you know, two separate witnesses will actually plead guilty of the murder in question. Um, so as I see it, Akutagawa's distinct explorations of human emotion and the otherworldly uh, serve a twofold purpose. First, while convincing emotional responses can make characters indisputably credible in the eyes of a jury, they're also easily fabricated. Um, and additionally, his use of su supernatural themes indicates his belief that human perceptions of reality aren't really rooted in realism. They're rooted in this sort of bizarre, like hyper-dramatized surrealism or the egocentric soup of human perception. <laughs> Thus, his transcendental, otherworldly testimonies, which contain stuff like extrasensory communication, or ESP, uh, spiritual transcendence, and even a dead man's account, they're almost cynical in their inability to be true. 
Uh, for lack of time, I will not be giving any textual examples at the moment, but trust me, it is legit. <laughs> now let's talk about Rashomon. So widely regarded as one of the greatest films ever made, um, Akira Kurosawa's psychological thriller fundamentally serves to put Akutagawa's thesis in practice. Uh, the director encourages us, the analytical audience, to become a non-resident jury, forcing us to grapple with our own biases as we search for an objective truth. Um, and just like in a grove, the crux of Kurosawa's argument lies in a few fundamental tools. And the first one I'm going to talk about is uh, um, audience identification characters. So in an attempt to rationalize the criminal's tale, which is a uh, fundamental, oh, oh yeah, sorry, as a means to fluidly relay his independent critique of purposeful and subconscious dishonesty in judicial systems, the director employs three men as audience identification characters. There's a woodcutter, a commoner, and a priest. Uh, these characters, just like the audience, are somewhat independently observing and assessing each testimony, and their sentiments, I believe, are pretty overtly reflective of Kurosawa's thesis. So in an attempt to rationalize the criminal's tale, which is fundamentally contradicted by three other accounts, the commoner introduces human self-interest as a factor in manipulating one's conception of truth. He says, oh. He says, uh, man just wants to forget the bad stuff and believe in the made-up good stuff. It's easier that way. So though sort of maintaining a firm belief in each story's narrative legitimacy, Kurosawa complicates the nature of individual truth by indicating that humans are sort of predisposed to accept happier truths, posing that the malleable nature of human memory disproves the existence of objective truth. Um, after assessing the wife's testimony, the, co the commoner furthers this notion that lying is inherent to the human psyche by saying, well, men are only men, that's why they lie, they can't tell the truth even to themselves. Here, uh, the man's existential argument encourages Kurosawa's audience to question their loyalty to truth. You know, perhaps if lying is an irrepressible component of the human condition, modern justice systems are problematic in their faith in human conceptions of reality. Now, perhaps Kurosawa's most important narrative tool is what I like to call the art of characterization, where Kurosawa encu encourages his audience to assess the accuracy of each testimony based on which character they perceive as being the most credible. Um, as each audience member brings different implicit biases and experiences to their approach, each viewer has a different sense of truth by the end of the film. So, the criminal is tied up with a rope and characterized by an almost insane anger. He kicks, he hisses, he laughs uncontrollably, and even insults the judge. In one's assessment of the criminal, one could cite his insanity as either a delegitimizing factor or an indication of his guilt. Either way, the criminal's truth is perceived differently by each audience member as they form judgments about his character. Contrary to her testimonial precursor, the wife is exceptionally apologetic and ashamed, repeatedly shielding her eyes and face to keep from crying. Uh, she's devastated and regularly overcome by a sense of maniacal shock as she cites being plagued by her husband's stare. Uh, once again, regardless of whether or not her disposition proves her legitimacy, the nature of the wife's characterization skews one's perception of her truth. And finally, uh, the, murder man's, the murdered man's <laughs> medium's testimony is characterized by an almost miraculous sense of wonder, you know, placing a difficult onus on Kurosawa's audience to interpret his or the medium's tale as equally viable. So these distinctive characterizations force viewers to personally observe the problematic nature of subjective justice. As the testimonies are not meant to be distilled into a single truth, the audience uses implicit biases to decide character intent, revealing how the pursuit of objective truth can become obscured by personal preference. Now let's talk about some modern implications. So, Kavanaugh. <laughs> I personally believe that this case is incredibly emblematic of Akutagawa and Kurosawa's theses as it fundamentally reveals the applied shortcomings of a judicial system that disregards the prevalence of partiality and externally motivated behavior. Um, as I see it, both Dr. Ford and Judge Brett Kavanaugh fundamentally relied on objective fact to supplement their narratives. Um, Dr. Ford voluntarily participated in a polygraph test and referenced former therapy sessions in which she is cited as affirming Kavanaugh's alleged assault. Um, and Judge Kavanaugh categorically denied sexual assault allegations on the basis of his personal high school records. Um, additionally, Akutagawa would argue that both Ford and Kavanaugh believe that they were independently credible in their assessments of truth. However, while they are expected to assess the nature of these testimonies based on pure and objective truth, uh, the Senate Judiciary Committee's partisan and personal ties ultimately prevented them from doing so. You know, not only were each senator's actions um, independently rooted in their personal experiences, but each individual was implicitly expected to vote in line with their constituents. 
Um, so the notion of external partisan and personal influencers is a recurrent theme in modern justice, one that is particularly relevant when considering the role of the Supreme Court. As Supreme Court justices' careers subsist on the pursuit of objective truth, implicit biases and other such staples of the human condition are antithetical to their practices, which is a difficult prospect as the Supreme Court is, is composed entirely of people with individual experiences and biases. Uh, Supreme Court partisanship has been proven conducive to many a scandal. Uh, Bush versus Gore is probably the most notorious one, but I really just included that so because this photo looks like the dramatic climax of a rom-com. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Additionally, though I won't stay on this for long, uh, many people are of the firm belief that our modern understanding of truth is sort of under attack, that our human subjectivity is impeding our ability to understand real truth. Uh, with instances of fake news and the sheer prevalence of straight up falsehoods in modern media, you're forced to ask yourself, you know, what's real? What's fabricated? You know, do I play water polo or is that just what I told USC? Moving on. <laughs> in reconciling these modern judicial constructs among countless others through Akutagawa's lens, one is able to discern the applicable dangers of pursuing objective truth in spite of the inherently subjective human condition. <laughs> So while a specific assessment of modern judicial scenarios reflects Ikutagawa's defeatist conception of modern justice, um, the end of the movie Rashomon is distinct in its divergence from Ikutagawa's fatalistic conclusion. Uh, while Ikutagawa insists that the quest for objective truth is entirely futile, uh, Kurosawa insists upon hope, asserting that one's true credibility can be assessed by the nature of their morality. Uh, perhaps, Kurosawa argues, some semblance of truth is inherent in an individual's adherence to moral codes. Perhaps when we set aside self-interest, we draw closer to relaying a truth uncorrupted by natural deceit. Uh, perhaps though we are ill-equipped to assess pure objective truth, the key to pursuing true realized justice lies in the coexistence of objectivity and the sub subjective practice of assessing moralism. Thank you. Thank you, Zoe. Yes, please. Thank you very much. We will uh, continue the discussion with regards to modern politics with Kazra Hadabi. Hey, everyone. My name is Kazra Hadabi, and I'm currently a senior at Winter School. Today, I'll be presenting my essay, Why Can't I Trust My Politicians? This essay, both analytical and personal, focuses on Plato's allegory of the cave and his ideas regarding the truth. And uh, I apply it to my, current, my future aspirations as a politician as well as our current political climate. So my dream to become a future ho office holder was sparked in 2008. President Obama's victory speech ignited something in me. There was something about the way he conducted himself and the way he engaged the audience that prompted a desire in me to do the same. I'd like to show you all a short clip from that speech that showcases a line I will never forget. This is our home. This is our time to put our people back to work, to open doors of opportunity for our kids, to restore prosperity, to reclaim the American dream and reaffirm the fundamental truth that out of many we are. So with this in mind, I began thinking of the best ways to facilitate these dreams, and my eventual answer to this question was twofold. My first answer was to study the tactics of those in power and those who are successful enough in campaign so as to assume a role of power, like Obama. My second answer, I decided, would be literature, utilizing text as an escort for these aspirations in my life. In terms of liter literature, I would more specifically be looking at myths, which would allow me to reach a more nuanced grasp of what I really should do. I mentioned earlier in my, that my intention was to focus on myths. I think that my rationale for doing so is articulated by Joseph Campbell in one of his books, The Power of Myth. Joseph Campbell, who was a professor of comparative mythology and comparative religion, wrote his book based off a PBS documentary in the late 80s called Joseph Campbell and the Power of Myth. It was essentially a series of six one-hour conversations between him and Bill Moyers. I presume that there are two quotes and ideas in this book that sums up his main argument. Firstly, he says, reading myths, quote, help you put your mind in touch with this experience of being alive, 
and quote, tells you what that experience is. Secondly, he says, myths aid us in revealing the actual meaning of certain aspects of our own life by en enabling us to turn inward, recognize the quote, spiritual identity of that very concept and then identify the role in which we are. So I took Joseph Campbell's idea and ran with it. The myth I focused on was Plato's allegory of the cave. For those of you who don't know, the allegory of the cave is book seven in the Republic. It is a story in which Socrates describes a group of humans who have been trapped in this underground cave since birth. They can only see in front of them. And in this cave, the only light they have comes from some fire that projects these shapes and things on the wall in front of them. Uh, the people in this cave believe that these shadows are the ultimate truth because this is they've, all they've ever seen and all they've ever known. But soon, Socrates tells us to imagine a prisoner escaping and seeing the real world for the first time. Though at first the prisoner might be blinded by the new light, he will soon be able to comprehend the seasons and the real workings of the real world. He makes a point about emphasizing the fact that this escapee must come back to the cave to share his findings with the rest, even if the prisoners may laugh at him initially. Throughout the allegory of the cave, Plato continuously highlights not only the importance of a willingness to pursue knowledge, but also a need to pass that knowledge to those who are stuck in their own artificial realities. After initially explaining the situation of the prisoners, quote, living in an underground den and their obliviousness of reality outside of their own, Plato juxtaposes the situation of the prisoners with that of those who have since escaped. He follows with his remarks about not only the salience of the truth, but also how much more enlightened one will be. He claims that after one has escaped the confines of the cave and looks back to, quote, remember their old habitation, the wisdom of the den, and their fellow prisoners, do you not suppose that they will felicitate himself on the change and pity them? The image that Plato provides of the escapee recalling his previously constraining reality alludes to the importance and value of the prisoner's departure. However, what's salient in the allegory of the cave is that Plato deems it, quote, necessary for leaders to achieve a fragile truce between, quote, those who never make an end of their education and the uneducated and uninformed of the truth. He claims that leaders must cease to cement themselves in the outer world while simultaneously refraining from getting mired down in the fallacies of the caved universe. In order to achieve this balance, quote, those who remain in the upper world must be made to descend again among the, among the prisoners and partake of their labors and honors. Through metaphorical language, Plato is once again asserting the salience of not only making the ascent to pursue knowledge, but also simultaneously transferring their knowledge of their enlightened selves to the unenlightened. As I look to connect Plato's ideas with the current politicians and the current political climate of our country, there seems to be a glaring contradiction. While Plato boasts about the importance of the pursuit and dissemination of the truth in leadership and governing, Leaders and governors today many times sacrifice relaying the truth in order to gain recognition. This bears the question of whether or not we, may, we must pursue the truth, of the truth in governing if the current ones in power are often deficient in this area, a question that served as a basis for my concluding thoughts. As evidence for my previous claim regarding the lack of truth in government, I'd like to examine our current president, Donald Trump. According to the Washington Post, Trump has, quote, made more than 5,000 false or misleading claims since he took office. This article was published in September of last year, so I'm sure this number has risen significantly. <laughs> <laughs> However, whether or not our president actually knows the truth or not, I cannot discern. But the fact of the matter is that he frequently demonstrates a reluctance to actually relay the truth. Furthermore, even when the media makes an attempt to bring forth news with the potential of accuracy, so long as it deviates from his agenda, Trump denounces the validity of the majority of their statements in an attempt to impede the public's view of the truth. He lies to discredit dependable sources and disallows them to create and inform citizens who have the capacity to distinguish an accuracy from a fallacy. We can further examine his precarious relationship with the truth in his recent non-disclosure agreement with Stormy Daniels. Merely months before the 2016 election, Trump's former lawyer, Michael Cohen, reportedly threatened, to sign the, threatened Daniels to sign the agreement and paid her $130,000 in order for her to refrain from discussing her affair with the president. Though in other cases we aren't sure if Trump actually knows the truth, this case stands out. For Trump is clearly aware of what had happened is attempting to shield it from the public via money. In conclusion, evidently there's a marked dichotomy between Plato's proposal and the algorithm of the cave and our, the current actions of our chief executive. And as I prepare myself in hopes of becoming a future office holder, I must make a decision. I presume that it's prudent for me to rank the pursuit and dissemination of truth abo above potential success via a moral compartment. I encourage you all to do the same. We should cease to sacrifice ethical, truthful behavior in order to gain political leverage and not allow ourselves to disguise the truth with erroneous remarks. The public deserves to know the truth in order to facilitate informed decision making, and by hiding that from them, we are crippling their ability to do so. Lying hinders the potential for an, un for an enlightened public, which Plato deems so, so crucial in society. I will invariably stick to what is right, and I count on those, uh, I count on those in positions of governing, current and future, to do the same. Thank you.
Thank you, Kaza. We'll be looking for your name out there, okay? Next from Buckley, we have Lisa Vilchik. Hi, my name is Lisa Vilchik and I'm a sophomore at Buckley. I will be reading my essay, The, De the Demon You Get, Adulterated Truths in Oranges Are Not the Only Fruit. I've always been drawn to the underdogs, the disempowered, women in a patriarchal system, people of color trapped in a world of white supremacy, gay and lesbian writers smothered in a system of religion-backed bigotry. What all these kinds of underdogs have in common, though, is that what dominant culture portrays to them as truth is really a kind of violence, a kind of oppression. This paper is ultimately about that issue. Orange is not a primary color. It is always a mixture of red and yellow, so it does not work in a system that relies on clean binary boundaries. It is always adulterated, corrupted, bastardized. It is impure. It is therefore a useful symbol in a book that constantly questions the arbiters of truth. Jeanette Winterson uses her position outside the boundaries of what her society and her church deem as valid to call into question any version of truth created by others. Whether she is undermining the truth of the Bible, the truth of history, or even the truth of her own autobiography, the one constant of oranges are not the only fruit is that no conception of the truth is entirely reliable. In Deuteronomy, Winterson suggests that history is not a factual recounting of true events, but rather a kind of conspiracy that provides a false sense of order and security. She writes that, quote, very often history is a means of denying the past, to fit it, force it, function it, to suck out the spirit until it looks the way you think it should, unquote. History, in other words, it is a story that pretends to not to be a story. It is a story that pretends to be true. However, Winterson does not believe in the truths espoused by others. Quote, some people say there are true things to be found. Some people say all kinds of things can be proved. I don't believe them. Unquote. Winterson has learned this lesson about other people's truths the hard way. From the time she was a child, she was told that one of the most fundamental things that she herself felt to be true, her attraction to other women, was in fact a falsehood, a lie a temptation by the devil to corrupt her very soul. We can thus see that the way she looks at history, something that takes the truth and tries to fit it, force it, suck out the spirit until it looks the way you think it should, is in many ways a metaphor for what people like her mother and the reverend try to do to her. Winderson's experience of religion is very similar to her religion of history, and it involves people trying to tell her things are true that she will behave in a certain prescribed way that is not at all true to her. For example, the reverend and her mother attempt in Joshua to convince her that her desire for Melanie is wrong and that it is the product of an evil demon inside her. In church, the pastor denounces them by quoting the Bible about perversion and lust. Jeanette responds by quoting the Bible right back to him, quote, to the pure, all things are pure. It's you, not us. This is a fantastic moment in the book because it shows that Jeanette trusts in the purity of her own feelings. And based on that, she knows that it is actually the reverend who is corrupt. The Bible, like history, is composed of words and stories that are open to interpretation. <coughs> it can be taken to mean just about anything, <coughs> depending who is doing the interpretation and what their agenda is. In Joshua, the agenda is clearly to get Jeanette to give up the supposedly evil demon inside her that makes her desire women. When the pastor and elders and Jeanette's mother attempt an exorcism, however, Jeanette finds herself in a delirious conversation with her not very evil demon, who tells her something very interesting, quote, the demon you get depends on the color of your aura. Yours is orange, which is why you've got me, unquote. The point of a demon, the orange demon goes on, is to keep you in one piece. This actually makes perfect sense because if Jeanette doesn't listen to the voice inside her, the very thing the other calls her demon, then she'll never be whole, will never be true to herself. 
Jeanette's truth is simply not what her mother and the reverend say it is. It is simple. It is not simple, but complex. It is not a primary color, but orange. Did Winterson's vision of the demon really happen? The whole point is that we cannot know. Winterson brilliantly undermines the supposed truths of her mother and the reverend, but she also questions her own truth, the veracity of her own autobiography, by filling it full of mythology. The numbers chapter is very telling in this sense, because it really brings home how much of Jeanette's life is a kind of fantasy or dream life based on made-up stories. Whether it's the Bible or her mother's unique version of Jane Eyre, Jeanette is always getting stories from her mother that suggest a way to navigate life that Jeanette finds confining and perverse. Her mother changed the story of Jane Eyre so that rather than following her heart and marrying Rochester, Jean instead marries a man she does not love and becomes a Christian missionary with him. Jeanette is confused by all the messages she receives about love because they don't seem true to her own feelings. So, she seeks truth herself by reading Beauty and the Beast. This leads to Jeanette having dreams where the men are beasts, like the wolf in Little Red Riding Hood. Fairy tales, perhaps, because of their obvious fictionality, give Jeanette a kind of outlet through which her true feelings can be revealed. Jeanette is legitimately scared of men and not attracted to them, and that combination is humorously manifested in her idea of beasts. It also makes a perfect setup for when she meets Melanie. Melanie seems very interesting to her, and she wants to keep looking at her and talking to her. It is just the opposite of how she feels about the beastly men. Thus, Jeanette's mythologizing and dreaming is also a very clever way for her to foreshadow her attraction to women. Winterson ultimately believes that even the facts are just a really just a story, and any time someone tells her their truth, it is not necessarily true in some larger way, but rather it is just the truth as they feel it, or see it, or decide to create it. In essence, every truth is a kind of fairy tale. <coughs> this mixing of truth and fiction ties back perfectly to Jeanette's orange aura. Since orange is a mix of various colors, and not a primary color unto itself, the way Jeanette sees the world is always a mix of colors. It is never clear or simple never black and white. But at the same time, she certainly knows what she feels to be true. And she is not willing to have the truth invalidated by religion or history or any other kind of story that doesn't do justice to the person she feels herself to be. The religion and family that Jeanette is brought up in simply does not allow for her homosexual inclinations. So she tends to escape into a fantasy realm. However, in Winterson's world, her fantasies are no less true than religion or history. In fact, it is arguable that Winterson sees things like fairy tales as more true than history, because they don't pretend to be true. At least they don't pretend to know all the answers or try to force everyone to read them in the exact same way. When truth is viewed as something that is always relative, then it makes perfect sense for Jeanette to embrace fairy tales and have deep existential conversations with the demons that others think are so evil. As she says, when she's told about her impending exorcism, quote, if I let them take away my demons, I'll have to give up what I found. What she has found is nothing less than truth, her truth, which is that since no conception of the truth is ever entirely reliable, we might as well create one that fits us and that is able, as the Order Demon says, to keep us in one piece. Thank you. I'd like to open it up to questions from the audience. So this is sort of similar to a question earlier uh, for the AI panel, but Zoe, um, do you think that the internet with all of the sources we have now and like the many, many sources of truth, do you think that is a help or a hindrance to actually establishing a truth or does it just keep it impossible as it was before? Yeah, so all of these sort of instances of, you know, disinformation and, you know, false truths 
are basically, I mean, they're forms of modern myth-making. They're essentially people, you know, disregarding any form of ex objective truth in pursuit of, you know, dispelling their own, you know, subjective beliefs. Um, and as I mentioned at the end of my paper, I feel like it's really important for every social construct that relies on truth to sort of have a coexistence of objectivity and um, subjectivism. <laughs> Um, so this question is kind of devil's advocate to most of the uh, speakers since all of you all are pretty much um, anti-objectivists in what I've collected. So despite there being a gap between the way we view the world and the way the world is or is and could be in and of itself, uh, can't we still find a self-expressive truth such as A equals A or 1 plus 1 equals 2? And should we attempt to act as though other beings interact in a world si similar to ours? Or should we reject objectivity altogether and live in a world of me, myself, and I? Um, so yeah, one of, one of the main goals of my essay was to sort of um, address a problem I've been coming across in, um, in my reading and in my writing, and um, that is sort of the, the gaps in, in um, how, how I express myself. So um, in, re in reading Derrida for, for this essay and then outside, outside of um, the classroom, outside of school, I came across, across this sort of idea, um, or this sort of like, uh, I guess, example of, of the sort of circularity of language. Um, the example he provides, or the, the sort of uh, thought he provides, is that um, you could enter into a dictionary, pick any word, and then choose the constituent words of the definition and go infinitely in a circle of defining and redefining words. And um, I think it's important to acknowledge that language, and then I know you reference like um, mathematical identities, are um, sort of the, the the parts of systems that aren't natural to us, that we're assimilated to, despite how natural they might feel. We think in a language, um, we interact with, with the world using math um, and, and science. Um, but I think that you know, we have to sort of recognize that we're using in every part of our lives really what is technology. I see language and math as technology. Um, that we, we adapted thousands of years ago. And I think that the systems are imperfect that we're using um, in even the most basic sense. And I mean, referring back to like this post-structural um, literary criticism that I read in preparation for this essay and for this presentation, I think that we need to acknowledge that these systems are in a sense self-contained, but also deeply flawed. And um, I hope that in discussing it, we can sort of um, maybe move forward and try to um, achieve an ideal um, system or, or achieve ideal forms. So, if that answers your question. <laughs> so, um, I guess the tricky thing with discussing, like you said, um, and, and kind of trying to sort through these different subjective points of view and these different subjective truths is that, like you said, like we're trying to attain an ideal truth, but would the very nature of of the acknowledgement of subject, subjective truths almost render the pursuit of an ideal truth almost like like almost unattainable or or what's what's what are your thoughts on on a collective pursuit of a truth and i know one of you guys brought up um like mythology and, and mythological myth myth making and whether you see that type of truth and archetypal truths as just as valid as mathematical ones and do you also see those as subjective um, just to speak to the relationship between like objectivity and subjectivity, I would say that even within objectivity, there's still a potential for, and there's room for subjectivity. Um, if, if we're looking at like uh, sort of like pol politics, um, like one, if we're looking at like left wing versus right wing, for example, media, um, like you can provide a statistic that is like based in facts and that's completely objective, but which, but it also allows room for subjectivity in that you can pull different things from um, a given fact and, and in a way, uh, turn around and make it your own. Um, and I don't think that providing the truth um, makes it so that you can't necessarily give uh, your opinion and a sense of subjectivity. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. I'll, yeah. <laughs> Got one up front here. Uh, 
Um, in a world that is arguably post-truth, is there still virtue and honesty? Uh, my mom's in the audience. She always says, you know, honesty is the best policy. And I have to, <laughs> <laughs> I'd have to agree with her. Um, I think uh, the value that I talk about in subjective truths uh, is that people can uh, honestly express their lived experiences. Um, and so from those, um, we can draw um, more accurate conclu conclusions about the world. You know, too long, we have either had uh, misrepresentations or lack of representation at all of um, certain perspectives. And so the honest uh, acknowledgement and the honest expression of personal truth, I think, certainly has value. And I would sort of counter your question with the notion that subjective truth is inherently more honest than objective truth, just because everybody's relaying their individual conceptions of the world, how they see it. And so, yes, I do 100% agree with the notion that there is virtue and honesty. Before I hand the mic over to Mr. Brian Wilkinson for closing remarks, let's thank this panel for their wonderful thoughts here today. And I will now hand it over to the head of the English department here at Archer and the faculty organizer of this entire day, Brian Wilkinson. Thank you. Thank you. That was wonderful. It's a great final panel. Um, and this has been a fabulous Lidan conference. Um, really stellar. I appreciate so much the, uh, the work that has gone into this. Um, I again want to thank uh, Isabel Ku and the leadership team for their efforts with this as well. Um, if anyone is interested, uh, in about 15 minutes, up in the courtyard gallery, there is a kind of uh, immersive art experience that you can go check out, whether you're a visitor or not, or a student. Um, and thank every, I just thank you all again, and have a lovely afternoon. <laughs>